appoint a judge either of the Supreme Court or of the High Court. And President of India has the liberty under the Constitution to consult any judge of the Supreme Court or any judge of the High Court for these appointments. Now, this is the original provision of the Constitution. And this consultative process has worked for many, many years until <coughs> we got to uh, you know, get the judgment of the Supreme Court in the Advocate on Records case, which turned the table completely. There they evolved a system of what is called a collegium, first a three-member collegium, then a subsequent judgment, which is a five-member collegium, and the rest of it you know. Now, <coughs> it so happened that this uh, it was a completely new system which the Supreme Court, by its judicial pronouncement, introduced into our constitutional system of appointment of judges. And now we have had it for more than two decades, this system. Almost in every uh, section of uh, the population, there has been a grave amount of doubts as to the power, propriety, and the justification and its efficacy <coughs> of this institution which the court created by a judicial pronouncement. Now what had been the result of this pronouncement? The pronouncement is the judiciary has used up the entire power to, unto itself to appointment any judge into the Supreme Court or in, in the high courts. The question is, is it in consonance with the constitutional ethos or the mandate of the constitution? And if not, then was the court justified in doing so? And if the court was not justified, then what is the remedy? Doubts have been raised at so many quarters that you have the fallout in the recent time, you know, there has been a proposed amendment of the Constitution. Uh, it has been, the, the bill has been passed by both the Houses of Parliament. Now it is awaiting the ratification of the states. Then you have a judicial uh, uh, commission, appointments commission under the Constitution, and you are followed by an enactment by the Parliament which lays down the procedure that has to be followed. The procedure laid down under the Act is there will be a six-member committee <laughs> which will appoint this, um, uh, these judges. Two of them would be uh, nominated by a committee, another committee headed by the Prime Minister and of um, what is called the eminent persons. Now all this is uh, being envisaged. So that is still not become a law of the land. In the meantime, I want to share it with you. The Supreme Court got an opportunity to have a real look at the correctness of its two decisions by which it created this, uh, uh, you know, system of uh, uh, collegium. <coughs> I had a uh, great opportunity to assist the court in this regard because I was appointed an amicus curiae to, uh, to help the court, assist the court to, uh, to understand the implications of that case and whether it was possible for the court to have a real look at the two, de two decisions. Uh, mm. All that I can say it is in the first instance the matter was heard by a bench of two learned judges of the Supreme Court and I was able to persuade the two judges to take the view that the, the two subsequent judgments, that is <laughs> advocate and the court's case and the special reference case, the seven judge and the nine judge judgment, which created the collegium uh, is not constitutionally correct and it really, it amounts to uh, rewriting of the constitutional provisions by uh, the judges, by usurping a power which they do not have. Because if it really amounts to an amendment of the constitution of article 200, 124 and also 217, the judiciary does not enjoy the power to amend the constitution, and this is an open uh, you know, uh, attack. So therefore, that should have been an opportunity for the court. The court was persuaded a two-judge bench formulated as many as 10 questions and referred the matter for hearing before a larger bench. But as the discipline, as you know, have to be, a two-judge bench cannot make a direct reference to nine or 11 judges. So the matter had to go through the route of the Chief Justice of India for placing it before an appropriate bench. The matter came before the Chief Justice of India and uh, the, the Chief Justice then in position chose not to act on this uh, reference. He allowed his tenure to lapse. Then the next uh, Chief Justice came, who was his successor. He posted the matter for a hearing before a bench of three. The matter was heard by the bench of three. The court issued notice to the Attorney General, to the government and everyone. But the greatest tragedy was when the matter came back to the court again after notice. The court took, uh, you know, developed a cold fit. So much so, the only question the court asked me, this is all fine, but what is the locus of this person who has, who has filed this petition? It's all right. It's cold feet. Yes, you are right. What is his locus? So I, I asked the court with great reference that uh, uh, the same question should have been asked to the Advocates on Record Association as well, because what is their locus? 
to question the appointment of the judges and question the validity of the other judgments of constitution benches. And um, in spite of uh, my, that's not just a rhetoric reply, I told them this issue was also, uh, you know, I was being confronted with this by a bench of two judges as well. And I was in a position to satisfy them and I will satisfy you as well. Yeah. These are causes which the court has taken up in the larger public interest. And you have relaxed the rule of standing many, many years before. If it is a question of the organic life of the country, which the Constitution undoubtedly provides, it's not just a document which lays down certain rules in black and white. It's an organic instrument. It concerns our day-to-day -day life of now we are billion plus population. Everyone is affected. Should you in such a question, case before you look for the standing of the person, you should be thankful to him that somebody has brought this issue before you. You should seize this opportunity and go ahead and do it. It is very unfortunate that um, the questions that were put to me by the court were very well, we accept what you say, but we need to know the credential of this man, what is he involved in, what is this trust, what kind of activities there are. So I told him my knowledge is limited to what is available on the records. I can only present that before you. Beyond that, I have no personal knowledge because I don't represent the trust. I'm, I'm a case before you. I'm presenting the case before you based on records available. So on the short ground that the credentials of the man was not available on record before the court, they chose to dismiss the matter on ground of locus, but it's still not uh, a dead issue in the sense that the person concerned, he came forward to file a petition before the court again and said, I could not assist the uh, you know, amicus on a question that you put to him because he wa I was not present. He was not uh, you know, given adequate new notice or something like that. So anyway, this ball is again before the court. The question is, this very interesting issue for the reason, and why I'm discussing it with you today is, that this is a time when uh, there is, uh, I mean, we've got to make a choice, and the and choice is before the people. Do you follow a radical method that is being now introduced by the amendment of the constitution, followed by uh, legislation by the parliament? It is undoubtedly radical. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt about it that what the constitution makers had provided to be the mechanism for appointment and, uh, of the judges and thereby insulate their, insu their independence, the, this mechanism would completely change that base. It's a completely new base. And the constitutional framers had not. Now the question would be, if the existing constitutional provision is the basic feature of the constitution, does this law really affect that? I have no doubt that it does on the face of it. But the question is, should you allow that line to be pursued or should not the court accept that it has gone far too wrong and get back to the original text of the Constitution, which has worked very, very well. And all of us are very familiar with that for the four decades that the Constitution functioned, we know the kinds of appointments that have been made. We know the kind of independent judges that have come through by a process of consultation as it was originally under the Constitution. So it's a big point for, for your thinking. One more aspect I want to tell you, so I'll take two minutes more. Uh, that's very important. This is all what is in the public domain. What is not in the public domain, I want to share it that with you. It's very important to secure independence of the judges from within. So for, we always talk about their independence by interference by the executive government and the legislature, politicians, etc. Have we ever looked at it? That are, are, are these judges today, are they, their independence secured from within, from the, within the institution? So, if I give you some of the examples, you would possibly feel that it is not, and that is the biggest danger. Because if you don't have uh, independence from within, and if the independence of the judiciary is threatened from within, then that is the biggest threat, and that must be uh, checked and should be stopped at the very beginning. I just give you some example. As a result of this, uh, uh, you know, new theory of collegium that the court uh, uh, propounded in those two judgments, the judges of the Supreme Court internally are now classified into four categories: the Chief Justice of India. Next category: the collegium judges, present collegium. Third, those who will become chief justice, future chief justices. Fourth, those who will become future collegium judges. The fifth are the rest. 
One judge, I, I just give you one example. One judge, you know, it's not, it's not a laughing story. It's a very serious matter I'm posing before you. You should know this. One judge, he later became a first puny judge, many years later. But when he was young and new, and he, was, he didn't belong to any of those four categories, he was in the fifth category. One day, he uh, received a call from his uh, residence that there was no water supply in his bungalow. So the result was the family ran into big problem. And as you know, water is a great necessity for all and equally for the judges and their families. So the judge could only do this. He called up the registrar during lunch hour and told him, look, this is the problem I have. I received the message. Please look into it. When he got back his home after four, he, he did not know what was waiting for him. You know what a great welcome he got from his wife and his children and other family members because water was still not available, not a drop. The poor judge had a feeling, am I a judge of the Supreme Court? And he was, he, it, you know, the officers made no uh, distinction, I mean, no mistake of conveying to him that they were you know, more concerned seriously about other judges who are in those one to four categories. Now, that's a great humiliation. For a judge, if you are a part of the judiciary, how do you feel, how do you do justice to, to others when you are, uh, you know, put in a position like this? So this categorization must go. One more instance I'll tell you and i end with that. With this, uh, you know, creation of uh, the collegium, we have also destroyed the self-dignity of the institutions of the higher judiciary and with the high court judges. I remember one incident, and all of you will also recall possibly, Justice Sabasachi Mukherjee was hearing a petition regarding a rectification of election, uh, electoral role in Calcutta, and the election was uh, in the offing very soon. Uh, against an interim order passed by him, an appeal was preferred in the Supreme Court. The matter came up before a particular bench of the Supreme Court. And that bench passed an order saying, we direct the, the High Court judge to take up this matter on a day to day and finish it, give a judgment within three days, decide this matter because of this. And when the matter went back, Justice Mukherjee you know, saw the order, read it, and he wrote a passage in his judgment. He said, judicial discipline compels me to adhere to what the order says. But the posterity will decide whether the Supreme Court has this power to call upon a high court judge to decide a case on his list within a time frame as the court desires. This is an insult to the higher judiciary. See, many of us use loosely an expression called the apex court. Now, I want to correct you on that. Apex is the, is the tip of the pyramid. Supreme Court is not. It is the high courts at the apex of uh, courts in the respective country. They enjoy the power. They have the base which they control by their supervision power under Article 227, etc. And also the, in the big, big role in the appointment. It is not so for the uh, Supreme Court. Supreme Court is not a court which has an administrative power on this. But in spite of that, the Collegium has done what? This service to them is a judge from the High Court, when he happens to be in, uh, in, in Delhi and he has to pass through, maybe for a very uh, you know, informal or a personal uh, you know, reasons, he is expected to call on these judge, senior judges, at least those who are in the collegium. And I'll give you one instance. I don't want to name the judge. Soli knows him too well. Every one of you could possibly could guess, because a, a judge happens to be very close to Soli and coming from the same region. He, a judge called on him, and, and, the, and the collegium judge, who was then number two in the collegium, he tells him, well, I have no time today. You can come tomorrow. Now, this man's program is completely shattered. You don't get a train ticket, this, that, whatever it is, the program. Now, this is the kind of an humility. This happened only because you have a collegium. If you don't have, but, uh, there is no question at all. So with that, I thank you so much, Sunny, and I think I've taken a lot more time than what I wanted to thank you. thank you, Ganguly. All I can say is no self-respecting judge will go to anyone in the collegium. Depends on the self-respect of that person. And nothing to do with my region, huh? <laughs> you that. that is for special, special knowledge. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. Acharya, who is the Advocate General of Karnatak, former Advocate General, a senior advocate, whom I have the pleasure of meeting in the evening that Santosh shake this space. <laughs> Enjoyed very interesting interactions. As the Advocate General, he would have his own insights into the matter. 
So once you are there, you know exactly there are many pressures on the judiciary. There are many influences brought up, which you can not detail in writing, but you can sense it, you can feel it. It works in a very subtle manner. And if I may say so, the most important thing is the judge must be independent of himself. His ideas, his predilections, his preconceptions. But judiciary is a human institution. It can't be perfect. Let's try and make it as effective, as free of imperfections as possible. And that's the effort in which we're all interested. And uh, we will be very happy to have Mr. Acharya's views on the subject. Respected Chairman Sri Soli Sarabji, other respected panelists, Sri Shankar Das Ji, Sri Upul Jai Surya Ji, Anil Diwan Ji, and all my colleagues and ladies and gentlemen. In our country today, if the democracy and rule of law has survived, it is because of our strong and independent judiciary. Therefore, it is of utmost importance that we should preserve this independence and strengthen it further. The founding fathers of the Constitution have evolved a system and have incorporated so many provisions in the Constitution so as to ensure the independence of the judiciary. The first is the tenure of office and the remuneration and other perks payable to the judges of the higher judiciary that has been taken care of. The only way a judge of the High Court or Supreme Court could be removed is by impeachment, which has not been possible even in one instance, which shows that the provision is as such has ensured the independence of the judiciary. The second point is judiciary has to be independent of the executive, apart from what Sri Ganguly said, within the judiciary. That is a different aspect. But most important is it should be independent of the executive. And separation of the executive and the judiciary is one of the basic features in our constitution. The executive should never have any opportunity to interfere with the functioning of the judiciary so far as the judicial aspect is concerned. Viewed from that angle, we can say that our judiciary has been independent right from the beginning, 1950 till now, except for some aberrations in between. One is during emergency when there was transfer of judges of the high court by the executive on the ground that their judgments were not uh, liked by the executive. And the other was the supersession of judges and appointment of the Chief Justice of India twice. First, by the, uh, when uh, Chief Justice Ray was appointed superseding three judges, and later when uh, Justice Beg was appointed superseding Justice Khanna. On both these occasions, we are very happy to say that the bar as a whole stood up and protested against this sort of executive supersession. And the result is, thereafter, there has been no instance where the executive has been able to interfere with the functioning of the judiciary. And at all other times, the senior most judge was appointed as the Chief Justice of India. But now, it is surprising that a former judge of the Supreme Court himself has come out with the version that this practice is not correct. The, uh, a suitable judge should be appointed as the Chief Justice of India and not the senior most judge. This is a very... You are trying to Justice Kachu. Please. You, t you take him that seriously? <laughs> anyway, I sincerely thank the chairman for suggesting that we should never take seriously a suggestion from, from this particular judge. <laughs> I respectfully agree with him. Now, when the 
constitution came into force, there was no scope for the judiciary to tempt the judges with any appointment or assignment after their retirement. There was, avenue was almost nil. Later on, the Commission of Inquiry Act came. Today, the position is not so. So many things happened. Commission of Inquiry Act came. Then you have got these tribunals, Central Administrative Tribunal, State Administrative Tribunals, Consumers Protection Act, under that some commissions, and several other posts offered to retired judges after their retirement. And this appointment, though not exclusively by the executive, it played a very vital role in such appointment. Now, this is a very dangerous trend. There should not be any avenue for the executive to tempt the judges that after retirement, they will have some plum post to be offered. This has to be put an end to. And therefore, the apart from all these commissions and tribunals, now we have a case of a former Chief Justice of India being appointed 